Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us. I'd like to welcome you to the Spirion CCPA 2.0, What You Need to Know Now, Now, <laughs> Need to Know Now webinar. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to introduce our presenter, uh, Scott Giordano, VP of Data Protection at Spirion. Scott is a highly regarded privacy attorney with over 20 years of experience. So with that being said, Scott, take it away. Wonderful. Thank you and welcome everyone to CCPA 2.0, what you need to know now, now, really like right now. So let's go to the next slide. And let's go to the next slide and we'll get fired up here. So as, uh, as you probably have guessed, there are some things you should not leave without. Uh, one of which is that if CCPA 2.0 wins at the ballot box, it will be set in stone. That's because it is a constitutional amendment not merely a statute. Um, it makes major changes to key privacy definitions. It uh, creates a new class of personal information and it creates a new government agency to enforce it. Um, so those are some of the things we'll be discussing in the uh, webcast today. And then finally, understanding what qualifies as personal information and special personal information, uh, where it lies and who has access to it is key, especially with respect to third parties. So. Without further ado, uh, let's go to the, the next slide and also want to encourage everyone to send in questions if you have them. If you send in questions previously, I will get to them, I promise. Um, even if it means that we don't get through all the material, I really want to make sure that all your questions get answered, so please send them in. So a couple things about the initiative. Um, official title is called the California Privacy Rights and Enforcement Act, or SUPREA. So we have another acronym, which is just great. Uh, you can find the initiative on the link that is up on the screen. So I wouldn't do it now, but you can certainly do it um, when you get a copy of the deck and you can have a look at it. Um, so it's uh, it's pretty big. It's about 51 pages, I believe. Um, so really joyful for attorneys to read. Um, don't know if everyone else is so enthused, but you're certainly welcome to read it. Um, also has lots of, of notes um, for the text as well, describing why they've done certain things. If it's passed by voters, it will go into effect January 1st, 2021. So imagine we've got the election about a year from now. And so if that is indeed passed into law by the voters, it will go into effect in about eight weeks after that. So it's not very long. Um, so as approximate um, uh, matter, it's really important to get this going now. Let's go to the next slide. And so let me talk about some principal changes to this. Again, I'm not gonna get through all this material. It's okay, I'm gonna hit the, the important stuff first. So there is a creation of a new agency, the California Privacy Protection Agency, or CPPPA. And so I'm going to have so much joy saying uh, uh, SEPREA and CCPA and other acronyms. But this is what we've got. So it's an agency. It's, it's tasked with enforcing not just SEPREA, but all the other state privacy regulations. There is a, a mashup of regulations we have in California. Um, things like Shine Light, for example, which I'll touch upon later. So in GDPR terms, this is a supervisory authority, and it's possible certainly other states have them, but really uh, this is going to be the leading one if it, if it is indeed is passed into law. So it does what's called administrative enforcement, and this is important because they've been given the power to subpoena witnesses, uh, get evidence from them. So all the things you're seeing in D.C. right now, for better or for worse, all that kind of action, is something that's possible with this agency. And it's, again, administrative enforcement. It's different from regularly going to court. Um, it's a different path to uh, enforcing laws. It doesn't require them to use the court system. Uh, there's gonna be a chief privacy auditor. Presumably, he or she will be appointed um, to conduct audits when there is a large-scale potential violation of the law, um, or um, in the early days, perhaps, to do some smaller-scale ones and to uh, build up uh, a body of experience. So this is something brand new. Um, it's, that's the kind of thing we're seeing in the EU. Um, there's going to be an annual disclosure by businesses for political use of personal information. And I'll, I'll talk more about that and why we got that. Uh, there's a statute of limitations that is for five years. So there's up to five years of, of violations or I guess alleged violations that could be pursued by this agency. And civil enforcement, meaning going through the court system, still possible via the Attorney General's Office in California. And I imagine the Attorney General's Office is really going to be deferential um, to CCPA simply because they don't want to spend time enforcing this thing unless it's especially egregious. 
Um, that's my guess, and I'm, I'm sure that that agency is very happy with seeing this uh, ballot initiative. Let's go to the next slide, and we'll dig a little deeper. So one of the big changes, this idea of sensitive personal information. And so you might say, well, Scott, I'm familiar with this because the EU has it via GDPR, and you would be right. However, this is much, much more expansive. So you've got key record indicators like a social security number or a driver's license number. So many things in our country are linked to social security numbers, and we use them, unfortunately, almost every day for things. So hence, it's sensitive personal information, passport numbers, but things that um, are maybe not so familiar to us. So personal information revealing someone's racial, racial or ethnic origin. Okay, this is straight a copy and paste from GDPR. But also something that we've done that doesn't appear in GDPR, the contents of a consumer's private communication. So that's fascinating. This is something that really opens up so much information as sensitive personal information. Uh, it's remarkable and it, it expands CCPA in a way that I don't think most folks appreciate, but you do now. Um, so sensitive personal information, and you might be saying, Scott, why do we care? What's the difference? Well, if you go to our next slide, we'll talk about that. Different set of rules for um, sensitive personal information or SPI. So now consumers can, can direct businesses not to use or disclose it, okay? Right now, we're in a state where you can tell a business, at least after the first year, don't sell my information. So you can tell them that, essentially it's an opt out. You can also tell third parties, don't sell my information. Here though, this is different. We're saying don't use it, don't disclose it. So that's remarkable. It really is. Um, it, it, it's, it's a sea change, folks. And so this is something that is going to have a tremendous impact because now you can collect this information, presumably, but you, there's not much you can do with it outside of the relationship you have with the customer. Um, also, customers must opt in for sale of SPI. That's huge. That's very much like the EU. So, for example, under the EU, you have to have a legal basis, one of which could be consent. And so now this is that's essentially opt-in. So is this. Also, this sensitive personal information cannot be used for cross-context behavioral advertising. And you're probably saying, I've never heard of that. What is that? Well, it's brand new. If we go to the next slide, we'll talk about that. Scott, I've got a question for you. Yes. Sure. Um, would the CCPA be funded with enforced fines? That's a very good question. I will go run that to ground. I don't know. Um, my guess is they will get to keep their uh, their fines, but I need to go dig it um, uh, into CCPA as exists right now and find out. So, um, in fact, let me make a note of that, and um, I will follow up with that on our next webinar. So let me do this. So CCPA funding. Um, presumably, this agency, this 2.0 agency, would get its funding um, as opposed to the AG's office, which just gets it from the general fund. And I've got another question. Will, okay. I guess, will the term sale carry the same definition that we are using today? Mm -mm -mm. Um, at this moment, I don't know. I should go dig into that and find out. I'm guessing that the idea of sale is going to be expanded underneath this because it seems that everything's been expanded or narrowed, as the case may be. So again, I will run that to ground and I will get that for the next webinar next month and we'll talk more about the concept of sale. Sale's already a very wide concept. It's not just literally selling something for money. It can be an exchange in kind or something like that. So we'll dig more into that. So great question. That's it. All right, then let's go. And if you have other questions, folks, send them in. We'll, we'll knock them down as they come in. Um, let's go to the next slide and let's talk about more principal changes. So I, I mentioned this idea of a cross context behavioral advertising. Um, so what is that? Um, it's, and forgive me for reading some, but I've got to read a little bit here. Um, it's targeting of, uh, of consumers based on a profile. And I put profile on red for a reason, folks, because we're borrowing this from GDPR. Okay, this idea of profiling, it's already been baked in in some ways to CCPA right now, but now this expands it. So it's a profile, it's based on a consumer's activity over time and across time in multiple businesses or across multiple distinctively branded websites, applications, and services. What does that sound like? That's ad tech. That's just straight up ad tech. And, and you might think, oh, well, that's cookies. It's much more than cookies. There's an entire ad tech ecosystem that most of us don't see any of, including myself, and but it exists. And all of this is designed to get an idea of 
an individual and where they're going and what sites they're going to and tying that all together into a package it's basically a profile set another way um, so this essentially goes after that and um, sale right now includes I'm sorry a sale that's been edited or modified now includes disclosure of this. So someone asked um, uh, last slide about expanding sale. This is one example where sale will be expanded um, cross context. So now all the rules for sales apply to this kind of information. This is remarkable folks again because you think of the entire ecosystem we have right now of, 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 of ad tech. It's really what, what powers the, the, the internet for lack of a better word. There's just so much of it that goes on right now. Um, because there's so little that actually gets paid for. Think about all the things that we take for granted. That's all ad tech. So it's a big deal. And of course, all the rules of sales that we have now, including the right to opt out, that's going to be a major headache for the ad tech folks and for advertisers. Um, also, cross context behavioral advertising is not a business purpose. So you can't use that internally. And you think about all the companies that use data internally to forecast or to develop their own advertising programs. Now that can't be used. So I'm guessing that many of your marketing programs probably already fall under this. And I would definitely have a talk with them because it's gonna make a big difference and it's gonna limit substantially what you can do with your own advertising program. Okay. Scott, I've got a question yeah. here. If uh, yeah. organizational policy states that we do not sell information, is there still an obligation to allow individuals to consent on the selling of PI? Presumably, yes. Uh, and there's going to be several buttons that, that uh, on your website that's going to be necessitated by this. So the short answer is if you say we don't sell as, as a policy, for example, but you want to create the opportunity for opt-ins, I don't see any challenge with that. Okay. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. So this idea of non-personalized advertising, and, and probably some of you are getting a chuckle out of this because that's almost oxymoronic, uh, but it, it's, we have this new concept now. So it's advertising and marketing that's not based on, on consumers' past behavior. Um, and it's relevant because this does not fall under the rules governing sales or business purposes I just described earlier. Um, what is non-personalized advertising? It's a great question. I'm guessing it's a banner ad that you can't click on. And, and forgive me for being a little bit glib here, but there's really not much advertising that's not gonna be, uh, it's not gonna be exempt simply because if you think about it, if this was a banner ad that you can click on, well, then you're interacting with it. If you interact with an ad, that's considered personal information. So I'm, I'm curious how this is gonna play out, this idea of non-personalized advertising. It doesn't seem like it's gonna have much value to advertisers. Um, so again, this is a brand new concept. Don't know where this is gonna go, but uh, it's very interesting and uh, I'll, keep, uh, I'll keep digging into it. Let's go to the next slide. Now, this is huge. Uh, this is use of personal information for political purpose. So under your Section 110 disclosures, those are the major disclosures that you have to make. So the kind of information, the categories of information you're collecting, and the specific pieces, all those things, there's about five different areas. Well, this adds another one. So if you're a business, you're using personal information you collected, and it's for political purposes, not, and it's for your own, not for others. So if you're a data processor, it doesn't cover you. But if it's your own thing that you're doing, um, then you have to reveal the name of the candidate or candidates, committees, et cetera, titles of ballot measures that you're, you're uh, opposing or supporting, um, whether information was used to support or oppose the candidate, committee, or measures. So um, you're probably saying what precipitated this? Um, if, if you want to take a guess, it begins with a face and ends with a book. Okay. So think back to Cambridge Analytica. This is exactly what it's designed to address. So this is um, uh, this is this is unique. Um, again, not something that you find in GDPR. Um, it's remarkable, um, really. And so this is the sign of the times here. So this is a Section 110 disclosure. So something that uh, you should all be aware of if your organization is in and of itself involved in political um, activity. Again, if it's just simply a data processor, doesn't apply to that. But it's really only if you are using this for your own accord. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Scott, we actually have a follow-up question. Yeah. Um, sure. The follow-up sure, sure. question for the opt-in or selling of information. If we do not yeah. sell any information, do we still have to have a button to opt-in on our website? 
if you're not selling it, period, then I don't see the utility of having an opt-in button just to have an opt-in button. So uh, no, I would say that wouldn't be necessary. Okay. Thank you. Next slide. Sure. Yes, let's go next. There slide. we go. There we go. So some other changes. Again, uh, I just gave you all the principal changes, the ones I think are most important. Let's go to some other changes and we can talk about just how important these things are. Um, so let's keep going. Um, Shane, I think I have a build on this slide. Yep, there we go. So, and let's, yep, there we go, perfect. So now personal information has been slightly expanded, and I say slightly. Um, now personal information is reasonably capable of being associated with, or could reasonably be linked, et cetera, et cetera. So if it's in light blue, it's been added. So you have two different ways to talk about personal information, and now you've added reasonably in front of being associated with or could reasonably, which is in bold, that is previous or existing. It was changed with some of the end of the year amendments. Um, again, I don't see much of a change to this simply because the most important reasonably is the, the second one, reasonably linked directly or indirectly. I mean, that's a very low threshold to clear. So I'm not sure why they felt necessary to add reasonably to this, but now we have lots of reasonableness to uh, the personal information definition. Don't see much of a change, but someone thought it was important to add it. Let's go to the next slide. Now, this is a fairly big change. This is a change about minors. So now businesses are prevented from collecting personal information uh, for, for children under 16. And um, uh, unless the child is 13 or older, the parent has, has affirmatively consented to the collections. They've opted in. So think about it the way we have it now. It's just the sale is limited. Um, and you have to opt in for the sale of personal information for a minor. Um, now that's also pertaining to collection, which is a big deal because you think about it, that cha that's a change from having an entire ecosystem to collecting personal information, um, which is, is something that many organizations may have if they're already um, looking at selling things down the road to children. Now that's going to have to be looked at and you're going to have to give that opportunity to opt in. So it, it's a fairly big change. Also, the penalties have been tripled. And here's what's interesting about that is that uh, the FTC and New York State fined Google about $170 million for violations of the federal uh, Child Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA. That's been around for quite a while, but that's a huge fine, the biggest in history, quite literally. So you can see that uh, for whatever reason, uh, violations against the personal information of children are being taken a lot more seriously. And this tripling of the potential penalty is, uh, is, is really consonant with that. So it doesn't surprise me a bit that we're seeing that. Scott, I've got go another question for you. Sure, quick. for sure. Um, all right, so this is a long one. Um, additionally, yep. applying as well to the debit world, um, the collection world of, of debit cards, if accounts are sold with potential CA customers, so I guess California customers, but the data is mm -hmm. being shared with the external party buyer and you have a BAA agreement on file, is there mm. any changes required slash recommended to address to address any any part of this um, relationship in regard to to consumers in California? That's, that's, a, that's a, a great juicy. question. <laughs> it's a great question. I think that that's going to wind up being on the follow up list. Um, I uh, that's a little okay. too much to parse through at this moment, but um, we've got it on the list. And yes, um, I definitely will um, will follow up on, on next month's um, a webinar since uh, it's going to be another CCP webinar. So. We will cover that, I promise you. Okay, and then will, will companies be expected to perform um, deeper diligence when it comes to asking a user if you are over 16? Yes, well, I, I think just because of the nature of the penalties uh, and the fact that uh, the feds are taking a, a, a harder look at this, I think it's incumbent upon everyone to take a look at verification. Um, right now, uh, there's the issue of age verification. We also have the idea of personal verification, which we'll talk about in a bit. The regulations have have added some 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 uh, muscle to that, but uh, that still, there's not a lack. Of, there's not a lot of clarity at this point. Okay. And then we had one more question, actually, a follow up to sure. the one question. Um, could you restate what type of report was that? Um, the BAA report. Could you expound on that a little bit? Well, I mean, a BAA report or a BA business associate report, I don't know if that's what the person's um, okay. speaking of. Um, that's a possibility. Um, typically, business associates report, uh, um, uh, agreements, BAAs, are for healthcare folks. 
um, but someone may be using that generically to describe an agreement with a uh, financial services. So um, okay. I will tackle, tackle that though on next webinar. Yeah, it was just, okay. That sounds okay. good. All right, so let's go to the next slide. So uh, other changes, access and correction. Consumers now have a right to, to correct inaccurate personal information. Currently, uh, under, under the regular CCPA, right now it was delete, but that was it. Uh, there was really no opportunity to make corrections. Now this adds that. Also, the regulations that just came down that I'll be talking about next webinar, um, those also added the ability to make corrections. Not terribly surprising that we're seeing this. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, another change, again, that I don't think is huge, but I want to note it. Um, currently, if you do business in California and you've got the um, personal data of 50,000 or more consumers, households, or devices, and you're, you're buying it, selling it, et cetera, et cetera, annually, then you're captured by the law. This changes that to 100,000, which was, my understanding, the original CCPA ballot measure before it got pulled used 100,000. I don't see big changes. I mean, if you're already in the business of collecting personal information from devices, for example, including cell phones or, or, or apps or what have you, then you've probably got 100,000 pieces of information anyway from 100,000 uh, consumers or their devices, et cetera. So the net net of it, I don't think it's going to change very much. Um, there was a question on the question list I got earlier about what qualifies you to, uh, the, to be subject to CCPA. If you do business in California, you've got gross revenues greater than 25 million, or you collect this amount of information, or you get more than half your revenue from selling personal information. And note that there's also a separate law now governing data brokers in California. I won't go over that, but uh, they're something to be aware of. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So household, this has been one of the great mysteries of CCPA, what's a household? Um, well, we finally know now that a household is a group of, of folks, however identified, of, of consumers that are cohabitating um, in the same residential address and share access to common devices or services by a business. Now, that common devices, think about your, your router, okay, that you've probably got up on the wall. That's the common device, at least one common device. You may have other ones. Um, think about the Alexa or the other devices that you have, to, and I've, they're like a personal assistant. Etc. All of those things are now covered. So every link in that chain uh, is going to be covered uh, potentially. So you may have a lot of gear in your house. All that's going to be covered because of um, its availability to all the folks in the household. Um, where this is going to be a potential issue that's going to have to be fixed is this idea that if you want to get a, a data access request from the household, it's going to have to be presumably screened pretty thoroughly because if there is a domestic dispute, uh, divorce is going on or some kind of other domestic issue, then courts are going to have to protect people um, in case uh, they're one side is trying to get dirt on the other, etc. So that's something that's going to have to be worked out, but we actually have a definition of household. I uh, don't know how much value it's going to add. It's probably just going to create a lot more work for everyone, but we now have it. Okay. Scott, to go back to your uh, yeah. previous slide, is the $25 sure. million globally or is it just for California? We we still don't know, and this is what's remarkable, is that I'm not sure why, why none of the powers that be will, will address this. I thought that the regulations that came down about a month ago were going to talk about this, and they didn't. I mean, there was so much the regulations didn't talk about, which I'll, I'll discuss uh, next month on the next webinar on the regulations, but this is one area where they didn't talk about it. And so we have to presume that it's $25 million globally until it's proven otherwise, because you don't want to get caught not being compliant with this because again this goes live january 1st the information security requirements are live january 1st so if you get hacked or you're sharing information unwisely with third parties that are bad then there is a big issue with that and so you just have to go with the assumption that it's 25 million globally until it's demonstrated otherwise all right other information, I'm sorry, other, other changes. Um, this idea of de-identified data, uh, and this is the killer, folks. Uh, the devil's in the details here. So now you're amending this information so that de-identified is information that cannot be reasonably uh, used to infer information, and I've highlighted the word infer. Here's why. 
uh, under data science that we have now, and we have data scientists certainly um, here at Experion, so I talk with these, these folks regularly, it doesn't take much to infer information about people. So it essentially narrows the definition of de-identified data. Uh, and in some respects, you can make the argument it all but destroys it because inferring information doesn't take much. Um, I, did a, I did a talk at uh, IAPP about a year or two ago um, about, about studies that um, I uh, reviewed. And one study said that if you had four date time combinations for payment card purchases like a credit card or, or something of that nature, that you could identify someone with 90% accuracy. Pretty good. So the net net of it is that de-identified data, very narrow now, if not utterly destroyed. Um, and currently, if you look at the, the bullet H there, um, it's just information that can't be reasonably used to identify someone, et cetera, um, even indirectly. Now this really um, turns that on its head and, uh, and all but, but um, eviscerates it. Again, in my view, um, the regulatory um, changes may presumably change this. I don't know. But the net net of it is that uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really narrowing the identified data. And I get that question a lot. You know, if I remove, if I remove someone's name, does that de-identify the data? No, it does not. So uh, a good lesson for all of us here that that's going to change that dynamic. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And employee data. Um, this is not terribly surprising change. Um, right now, there's a one-year hiatus on employee data being covered under CCPA. Also, this idea of business-to-business -business due diligence. So say that you're banging on the keyboard looking for a new data privacy solution. And you get a whole bunch of businesses and you start clicking on their websites and downloading stuff and all the stuff that we all do when we're doing due diligence. Um, all of that interaction with the websites and ads and all those things that's covered under CCPA, there's going to be a one-year hiatus for that right now. Under CCPA 2.0, it just does away with it entirely, which, uh, again, doesn't surprise me terribly because the folks that started CCPA 1 for the ballot initiative didn't contemplate um, business employees anyway. So not terribly surprising here and not a huge deal. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, profiling, and I probably should have made this a principal change in retrospect. Again, it's part of Section 110 because it's a fairly big, if, especially if you have serious marketing operations, essentially now you have to disclose the profiling of consumers. And if you, if you say, gee, Scott, this sounds just like a GDPR, uh, it's, it's very much drawn from GDPR. What's interesting about it is that uh, you have to reveal whether you're profiling them. Okay, so you're using personal information for determining eligibility for financial, lending, housing, insurance, all kinds of stuff, employment, uh, by the way, healthcare, et cetera. Um, also, and I highlighted this, meaningful information about the logic involved. What does that mean? That is the algorithms, folks. It's all about algorithms. And this is just remarkable because presumably uh, the crown jewels of a company, uh, at least a tech company, is going to be the algorithms that are being used to determine who qualifies for what. Um, this is now, again, just like GDPR, uh, where they talk about um, logic involved. I, they use a different word, but the point is that now uh, algorithms are now subject to, to CCPA. So that's remarkable uh, because how many organizations have advanced marketing capabilities where you're trying to profile customers and get an idea of who's going to be uh, amenable to your, to your services, your products. So it's a big deal. Um, and again, we have the uh, definition of profiling below that. So evaluating uh, or predicting personal aspects, why someone might buy something versus something else, and it concerns things like your performance at work. I'm highlighting that because that, again, ropes in employers. Um, your economic situation, health. Again, all of this is very much, if not copied and pasted, drawn heavily from GDPR. So keep an idea or keep a lookout for their jurisprudence on this as well because that will likely have a big impact on ours here. Okay, let's go to the next one. Yes, uh, right to access to information. So right now there's a rolling 12-month limit. Um, this effectively does away with it. And it, it, the language they used wasn't terribly clear, but effectively it does away with the 12-month limit unless it's unduly burdensome. So remember that backup tapes are not subject to CCPA based upon the draft regulations. So that's not going to be an impact unless you restore the backup tapes. Um, so that's good news there. 
But with this 12 month rolling limit, basically it's now like GDPR, where essentially whatever you've collected is, is subject. So now is a very good time to take a look at whether you really need that information that you've had for the last 10 years. Uh, it may be that it's just not relevant anymore. So again, I imagine a lot of folks are gonna have to go through their databases, especially marketing and so forth, and determine just what information they really need versus what they don't, because uh, that 12 month limit uh, going away opens up the door to a lot more work for you. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So publicly available information. So this really expands the, the idea somewhat of publicly available information in the sense that it's not just things that are lawfully made available from government records, but uh, information that business has a reasonable basis to believe is lawfully made available. Now, I don't know how you're gonna prove that you have a reasonable basis to believe this, but potentially this could protect a business that's revealed something that it got uh, allegedly from a government record or something other than a government record that looks like a government record and they've made available um, to the public. So it's not something I would hang my hat on and say, well, based on my belief, I think this is public available. You're really going to have to have some evidence. So I don't know how greatly this expands publicly available, but it's something that they chose to throw in there. So again, um, something that your um, information governance folks and the people that develop your products, if information is part of your product, then this is something to take into account. I imagine those that are doing any kind of, or perhaps real estate related things, because so much real estate information is obtained from government records. So um, that's entirely possible. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Data minimization. Um, I did not expect to see this one coming, but uh, it, it's here. So we think about GDPR, they have their own data minimization. So now, not only when you collect information, are you required to do all the things we talked about earlier about with respect to, uh, to rights to opt out or opt in as the case may be, et cetera. Now, um, it shall be limited to the personal information that's reasonably necessary to achieve the purpose for which it's collected. So this is something that we've been doing for, for a fair amount of time with GDPR, uh, data minimization. Um, they don't call it that, but that's essentially what, what CCPA 2.0 is saying is that you now have to minimize data. That's part of the larger data uh, protection by design and by default. This idea of data minimization, just collect what you need and nothing else. Historically here in the US, we just collect everything and then we decide later whether we're gonna do anything with it or not. So this really turns it on the head and says, okay, now you're only gonna collect things that you absolutely need. Uh, if you have to get more later, then you'll have to go and address the opt out or opt in um, sale restrictions as the case may be. So again, not, uh, I didn't see this coming, but um, this is now part or will be part of our, uh, um, our legal system. Okay, let's go to information security. Um, this uh, is not as much new stuff as I thought we were going to get um, when I heard about the CCPA 2.0. I thought there'd be a lot more in InfoSec, but here's what we got. Um, we have this idea of large data processors. And so if you have more than 5 million consumer records processed annually, then you're a large data processor. So you're going to have to conduct audits, publish risk assessments, which you should be doing anyway, um, not just, well, maybe not publishing them, but creating them. Um, but this will be regulations that will be issued uh, by the new agency. And so uh, businesses that collect personal information have to put in reasonable security procedures and practices appropriate to the nature. This is basically the same as what we have now. So it's a positive mandate, but it's a mandate. And uh, versus CCPA, which said that if you didn't put reasonable uh, measures in, then you were subject to CCPA penalties. So they posit they, they couch it in terms of a, of a negative, this couches it in terms of a positive. Um, also, uh, curing a breach, which um, is, is kind of the running joke about CCPA, about you know how do you unring a bell. Here they say implementation and maintenance of reasonable security procedures and practices following a breach does not constitute a cure. So um, doesn't really help us with what a cure is, but we know what a cure is not. So those of you that were hoping that CCPA 2 was gonna give you the opportunity to cure, um, unfortunately, you're going to be disappointed. There is no opportunity here for that. Also, remember the expanded definition of personal information. Um, we mentioned earlier about sensitive information. Uh, so bake that into your InfoSec posture. 
Also, you're probably asking, well, wait, what about the new regulations? Do they have uh, some InfoSec in it? They have some, but all they're really talking about is the necessity to have reasonable uh, security procedures for verifying people and for transmitting information. So it's not terribly helpful. It's just really, it's nothing else implied already. Scott, we've got a couple questions. Yeah. Um, sure. Would data minimization include cookies that can track activities and are persistent for a number of months? Yes, because if it's collecting information, you have to ask yourself, do you really need the information that's collected? And I'm presuming that you can fine tune cookies to collect certain things and not collect other things. I know that there's strictly necessary cookies, there's other kinds of cookies. So yes, if you can, to the degree you can tune your cookie to minimize to what you're only needing, then, then you're required to do it. If it's an all or nothing cookie, you can make the argument that that's a different discussion. But by and large, any measure you can take to minimize what you're getting to only the things you need, um, doing that in good faith and documenting it, this is something we've been doing for a while at GDPR, I would recommend that. Okay, and we've got one more question here. Let's see. Oh, nope, never mind. Nope. Okay. Next right. slide. Okay. Hey, wonderful. So let's talk about data quality. Again, they don't use the phrase data quality, but, uh, and I, again, I did not see this coming either. Um, so a business that collects a consumer's personal information shall take reasonable steps um, to ensure that it does not collect, retain, or share inaccurate personal information. Um, I think this was directed, um, actually it wasn't be directed at credit reporting agencies because they're basically exempt from this. So basically if you're collecting information about a consumer, um, but you're reporting to a credit reporting agency, presumably that is targeting you. Um, so even though it really applies to everyone, my guess is that that is the, the, the impetus for this. Because you think about if, if you pull your credit report, and you know, we can pull our credit reports yearly for free, you can get all three of them. And I, I urge everyone to do that because so much crazy stuff shows up in credit reports. Um, just the spelling of your name, uh, your telephone numbers, all kinds of crazy stuff shows up that you have to go and, and, and cut out. And so I think this is a step in requiring um, organizations to, to take measures to make sure they actually have accurate information about you. So again, didn't see it coming, it's great, um, I think, but um, this is something that now we have to add to the list. We've got another question that was for the previous sure. slide. Um, what sure, if you sure. process on behalf of the client? For example, they are the controller and you are the processor. Are you still considered a large processor then? Oh, good question. Um, I, I, my guess is the answer would be yes. Because remember that, that the point of this is, is that if you're a large processor and think about all of the, the companies out there that, that do that very thing. It's not just Amazon and, and, uh, and, and Microsoft Azure and all that. There's a lot of companies that do that. It, it's a mechanism for making sure that they've got their ducks in a row. Think about uh, GDPR. Processors are basically held to the same standard as, as principals, as controllers. So my guess is that, th that this would definitely apply to processors as well or to, or to contractors or service providers, et cetera. Um, but again, I will run to ground. We'll talk about it um, on the next webinar. All right. Next okay, slide. So, Please, let's talk about contractors. So um, under CCPA 1, okay, uh, you have this idea of a third party that is, an, or is, is a person, a legal person, that's not either the business itself or someone with whom gets information uh, pursuant to a contract, i.e. a contractor. Well, now they actually have decided to call that person a contractor instead of saying that they're a person that, that gets information under a contract. So it, it was kind of strange they didn't do it in the first place. But now, um, if you are a person and you are not collecting it under your own accord, um, and you're doing it pursuant to a contract that prevents you from selling it out the back door, et cetera, then you are a contractor. So now we actually have a word for these folks we did not before. Let's go to the next slide. And under CCPA 2.0, now that we have a contractor, um, it's a business that you, the company, disclose um, consumers' personal information, um, you know, pursuant to a contract that prevents them from selling the information out the back door. Oops, uh, don't go there. Or also includes a certification. So this is why this slide is important. So now if you're a contractor, um, you're handling data 
you now have to include a certification um, that you understand the restrictions of not selling people's information out the back door. Again, I'm being a little bit glib here, but the idea is that now you have to demonstrate knowledge that you know your responsibility, and you can bet that that's going to be used as a get out of liability card um, on, by the, the business if you do something wrong to the contractor. So keep in mind what you're certifying to because it will come back to haunt you. Okay, now let's go to the next slide. Okay, let's talk about your questions answered. So if you had emailed a question in, it's going to get answered right now. So let's start off with applicability of CCPA to a large general contractor, I'm presuming that's a building contractor, uh, with business nationally, including in CA. Well, uh, we showed you earlier about what the criteria was for anyone. So it's not just a GC, it's anyone. If you're doing business in California, which is a very low threshold, if you've got either 25 million uh, in revenue in some way, shape, or form, or you're collecting information uh, from 100,000 people, households, or devices, or you're selling information, you're getting half your revenue from it, you're captured. So here, large general contractor, depends how much exposure you have to California consumers. If you directly deal with other contractors and the builders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera probably a very little exposure uh, unless you have a public presence and presumably uh, prospective buyers of homes can go to your website and look at information, then yeah, you can make the argument that, that consumers are gonna be implicated. But uh, if, you're, if you're purely business to business, exposure is not gonna be terribly great. Second question, are there any document industry thresholds when the combination of secondary PII um, it should be viewed as PII? Um, the short answer is no, and here's why I don't think it would be very helpful. Because as data science advances, it takes so little to connect people to determine who someone is using this secondary PII that you're, you're citing here, that I don't think the threshold would be very helpful. Now, we already have some criteria for healthcare data. And in fact, if you go to DHHS, Department of Health and Human Services, they actually have a section there talking about this very issue um, and the different methods for determining whether your data sets be identified. But as far as anything above and beyond that, no, and I don't think it's a good use of time personally, just because it's a moving target. Third question, um, are you seeing these regulations being used as a template for other states? Yes, here in Washington State, where I live, uh, we almost had our own CCPA. There was also a more or less a clone of CCPA in Texas that uh, almost made it through the legislature last session. Other states have seen it as well. Um, New York had uh, something that was different from what they have now. They have the SHIELD Act now, that made it through. But there was another law that also um, created a very expansive definition of personal information that didn't make it. Um, I suspect next session, um, starting in January, we'll see all of these CCPA clones reappear. Is there any talk of federal all-state regulations? Yes, there's talk every day about it. I wouldn't spend much time chasing this down. I don't think we're going to see anything from the feds, just simply because now that this is the law in California, uh, you don't want to risk making the California legislature angry um, and the, the congressional committee um, a delegation rather uh, angry. So I don't see it. Um, fourth question. Please discuss or explain the applicability criteria, um, who's subject and who's exempt. Well, um, at, from a 30,000 foot view, really um, everyone that meets the criteria that I described earlier is subject to it. Um, who has a one year exemption right now? If you're a big advertising company, okay, so look at the Googles and the Facebooks of the world. Um, to the degree that, that an employee is interacting with your ad, that when they're doing research, Again, that's been suspended for a year, and CCPA 2 does away with that, basically. Um, so that is an exemption, essentially. Employee data is exempted under CCPA 2.0. So really, it's, it's less about what industries are exempt. Um, there are things that are federally mandated. So think about HIPAA regulations, GLBA regulations, um, Fair Credit Reporting Act. That information, is exempted, but not the organizations. And this is important, folks. Some folks are telling me, oh, we're a hospital, we're not subject to CCPA. That is not true. Uh, if you have information not covered by HIPAA, then that information is indeed covered by CCPA. So think about all the marketing outreach that you're doing, potentially. Um, even if you're not selling it to third parties, you're using it for your own accord. 
that's potentially going to be covered under CCPA. Same if you're a financial institution, same if you're a credit reporting agency like the big three. So don't presume that just because you're a hospital, this doesn't cover you. Um, always ask your attorneys to dig into this because the devil's in the details. Um, also like to know about verification requirements. Um, this is this is a tough nut. Right now, there are no standards of verification requirements. Everyone's being asked to make it up as they go. And again, I know that sounds a little bit cynical, but it's essentially where we are right now. There's just there's just not a lot of information on verification. What my clients in the past have done, and when I've worked at other places, is that they've simply gotten information determining that you are who you say you are, like a driver's license or a passport, and then a utility bill or a property tax bill or something like that. So it's tying you to a location. So that's the kind of stuff that I've seen in the past. And some folks have pointed out that you're collecting more information that you might have otherwise. And yes, that's true. You're collecting more information that you would have otherwise for um, connecting with someone. But that's just the nature of this. You, you have to be able to do a good faith uh, validation that someone is who they say they are because if you give it to the wrong person and perhaps there's a domestic dispute, that could create all kinds of problems, especially if there's a restraining order against the other party. It's just, it's a great opportunity for a mess. Another reason why you want to call your InfoSec folks and your lawyer to make sure that everyone's on the same page because this is going to be one of the, the tougher nuts of CCPA. Scott, Let's I got go a question for you. Sure. Real quick. Sure. Um, what is yep. the obligation sure. to pass along a request for deletion to a contractor or third party? If well, obligated. Is there an obligation to confirm the request for deletion is complete? Oh boy, that's a very good question. Um, I don't know if there's an obligation to confirm it. My guess is that, and as far as the obligation to pass it on, it, that's implied in the law. So uh, almost certainly, I would say yes, you have either explicit or implicit, you have to pass it on, otherwise the law couldn't be effectuated. Um, in terms of practicalities, you can bet that all contracts, whether it's a service provider, it's a contractor, it's um, a other third party, uh, otherwise designated, all going to have the same thing, saying that thou shalt respond to my requests for, for opt out or opt in, as the case may be, and we'll verify. Guarantee that it's going to be in every, any lawyer is going to put that in there just so that they're putting the onus on the other party. Um, also note that for contractors, since you have to essentially attest to the fact that you understand you're a contractor and your duties, that's just going to get baked into it anyway. So there's no way to, to, to escape that. All right. I've got another really good question. Sure. Is the sure. use of data for joint marketing agreement considered, quote unquote, selling data, or is it still considered your company's marketing? Okay. Um, the short answer is if it's with another company, for sure, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a sale because essentially you're transferring that data uh, and it doesn't have to be for money. So the sale is very, very broadly defined. Also, if it's across brands, so say that you're a conglomerate and you've got different brands and you're sharing all that information across brands, also it's going to be considered selling it. So yes, all the rules apply in either of those uh, situations. Um, so again, this is why now's the time to really dig into this because there's a lot of gotchas here. Okay, but another question. Is there a good sure. example and description of what the state is looking for concerning data mapping? Well, there's no rule for data mapping. And just for the edification of the audience, you have two ideas. You have one, which is the creation of a data inventory. So if you've done GDPR, you're familiar with Article 30 data inventory, creating this living directory of all the information under your control. So that's something that if you don't all have, you should be developing it feverishly right now because you need a single source of truth for all that information. When I first developed one, this is probably five, six years ago, I did it all by hand. Um, but I had, and it took probably six months of work getting everything together and talking to people. So that's why it's so important to do that. Um, as far as data mapping, that's entirely up to you. The idea is that you want to create a visualization where you can show all the directions of the data. Uh, who it's going to, and from there, where it's going from there, and where it's going from there, and the entire ecosystem. Again, it's for your own edification, because if the regulatory body asks you questions, you want to be able to have correct answers. The last thing you want to do is be seen as being deceptive, because that's when they're going to bring the hammer down on you. They, they love doing that. Um, just look at all the GDPR violations and, and how companies were saying, oh, we didn't know, you know we had data or what have you. Uh, they weren't buying it. The supervisory the authorities weren't buying it. So the net net is, California doesn't require you to do data mapping, 
I would do it for your own edification. It's going to make your life a lot easier in the long run. All right, I've got a couple more questions, um, but we're okay. almost at the top of the hour. If your firm's record retention policy and or record, records retention schedule stipulates that you retain records for a specific period of time for a variety of reasons, whether it be legal, business, regulatory, does this trump the CCPA requirements to delete data when requested? The short answer is yes. So uh, if you're, say that you're a securities broker and you've got a, a broker dealer, got a hold it for seven years, then you hold it for seven years because federal law is going to trump that. Um, so, so yes, uh, app, the short answer is yes. Okay. I think we're let's, good. Let's next, go to the next, next slide. slide. I think we've got okay. a couple more There we go. questions. All right. And, and so... Uh, best practices to balance system-based protection versus human, uh, human training-based protection. Um, I can tell you this, uh, the best information security control ever invented is an alert employee, full stop. And you're, whatever you're spending on training your folks on InfoSec and privacy, you're not spending enough. I can just tell you from my own experience for the last 20-something years uh, in corporate world, there's just not enough training done. And I can tell you it's a huge help because people, once they are taught to recognize what's personal information, uh, what what you can and can't do with it, then that really changes everything because people will then come find you and go, hey, did you know we're doing this? Or did you know what you're doing with that? I got that all the time at previous employers where they would people would just come up to me randomly and say, hey, do you know we're selling this information to so-and-so? And I would say, no, I didn't. So you can't spend too much on training in, in my view. I highly recommend investing in it. Um, what are the implications of this law for nonprofits? Nonprofits at this moment are not covered. So if you're a nonprofit, uh, you're in, uh, in the clear. Um, there's still plenty of work for nonprofits to do anyway. Um, if you're processing personal information for donors and so forth, still take a hard look at your InfoSec and, and how, um, how strong it is because um, I've heard just endless stories of nonprofits getting hacked because they look like easy targets. What are key things need to be changed for organizations that don't sell citizens' data? Well, here's the thing. Even if you're not selling the data, okay, put that aside entirely. Information security, Section 150, still arguably, if not the most important, highly important, you've really got to get InfoSec uh, ready to go. Because, again, January 1st, if things go wrong, then you're talking about a class action lawsuit. If you want to see some horror stories, you can look at the Marriott class action lawsuit. It's 373 pages long. Um, great reading, by the way. Uh, you can develop an entire InfoSec program just by reading that, that, uh, that lawsuit. Question, what impact will Shine the Light have? Uh, will we be required to name or itemize third-party providers at the request? Yes, you will be. This does not change Shine the Light at all. So if you're sharing information to third parties, for purposes of marketing, then you are subject to shine the light, still have to do it, no, no exceptions there. Um, what are the most key differences between CCPA and GDPR? Um, that's a longer discussion, so what I've done here is I've actually added two more slides. So if we go to the next slide here, you can see I've summarized the three primary differences between the two, so whenever you download the slide deck, uh, it'll be available in about a week or so, you can see them here. Also, any InfoSec people, if you go to the next slide, I've also broken down the requirements of GDPR versus CCPA for InfoSec um, incident response and breach. So you have that to look forward to. Let's go to the next slide. So I talked earlier about data mapping versus data inventories. Um, this is a sample data inventory that I've done. If you've been on my webcast before, you've seen this. And in the red box is where the personal data elements are. Um, and I highly recommend, again, if you haven't done a data inventory, please do so. Uh, it's very important to be able to keep track of everything. Let's go to the next slide, and we'll talk about getting there from here. So I talked about uh, creating your data inventory. Um, still, my experience has been that for every two applications you find that have data inventory or to have personal data, you find a third. So that's why starting on it now is so important. Um, your data subject access request, or DSAR, I'm just calling that generically everything a DSAR. That's going to be a big challenge, especially verifying the requester. Get on that now. Um, determine what you're going to put into the report so that you're not doing it ad hoc. 
uh, because that's going to be a challenge. Determine how you're going to get it to people. If you're just going to put it through their customer account, I've seen that as a very common thing where you can just download it as a customer. Um, and Facebook does this pretty well. Um, or you're going to just email it to them, uh, just run a report, email it to them, or you're going to snail mail them a copy. Um, also make sure you have a protocol, like for example, a ticketing system to make sure nothing falls through the cracks. The most likely avenue for getting punished by the government is going to be someone complaining. And then also prepare draft updates to your privacy statement because they are going to incorporate all the Section 110 disclosures that I talked about earlier, plus all the things that are already part of the law. So, and let's go to our final slide. So this is even more demanding than CCPA 1.0. So we're just getting ready for 1.0 and already we've got 2.0 coming down the pike. Not unlike GDPR and you're going to have all the same suspects involved, legal, marketing, HR, product management, et cetera. Um, more guidance is gonna be needed in several areas like information security and invalidation verification. Um, in fact, it's gonna be a lot more. Penalties are going to be severe simply because you have the duality of class action lawsuits for 150 violations and then also regular penalties by the, uh, by the state. So get started with the data inventory. A legislature will not be able to help you with this um, simply because this is gonna be set in stone. They can add laws that expand it um, or otherwise clarify things, but they can't change CCPA 2.0. Only a constitutional amendment can do that. So they can't come to the rescue, um, for better or for worse. And But wait, there's more. We have a webinar coming up on December 10th on CCPA regulations, because I know how much um, interest there is in CCPA regulations. So we'll talk about that. I'll we'll also answer some of the questions I couldn't answer for this webinar. So um, right. that's Actually, all I have, I have. We have time for one quick one more. Um, so you got two minutes? I've got, I've got, yep. Um, with the Attorney General's record keeping under 999.317, the various metrics mm -hmm. have to be disclosed as in C CPA? Do you want me don't to know. Okay. No, it's okay. Um, I okay. will cover it in the next webinar. The answer is I don't know. Okay. So I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. We had a lot of great questions. Thank you for participating. And be on the lookout for the PowerPoint presentation and a link to the webinar recording. Um, and like Scott mentioned, please join us on December 10th for um, another webinar called Unpacking the New CCPA Regulations. Um, please go to our, our website now, spirion.com, and register. And we hope to see you all there. Thank you.